Hi, welcome to One Word a Day. I'm Sophie, your pilot into the universe of Chinese. We are going to continue our journey in learning just a little bit more about this amazing language. We have come across some very useful expressions talking about how people react to suffering. You can cry your bitterness out or you can be as muted as somebody who doesn't have words, who cannot speak it out. So yeah, that's your phone in, is describing this muted person cannot cannot voice their bitterness. Um, you cannot cry out, definitely. So we continue with yeah, but, and today I'm introducing you to um, conditions, human conditions, that's um, one is deaf, one's in mute, and probably a lot of times this both conditions are con uh, connected and they, I, if you're deaf, most likely you're mute because you never get to hear how people speak, right? So deaf is probably a precondition of a mute, but not necessarily. You can be deaf, you can be deaf, deaf later, but you already learned your language. So therefore you're only deaf and not mute. Um, I don't know exactly how things work, but we have sign language, right? So we avoid the audible, I mean, the audible function of language by using the visual to be able to still communicate to mute person. Uh, but this is Chinese way to describe uh, the conditions. And actually the people who have such conditions, one is longs, one is ya, but, um, okay, you can see both of them are light sound. We don't pronounce them fully extended, like a long zi, zi is the full sound of this by itself. We will pronounce it as zi. Actually, in all of these ancient philosophers of China, we call lao zi. We don't say, well, if we say lao zi, it's a totally different thing. Lao zi become like an honored person. This zi is specifically talking about this lao zi. If you you know read Chinese philosophy a lot, this you will definitely this person, this scholar, you'll definitely come across. And uh, Kong Zi, Confucius, all Westerners probably know that, and his name ended with zi as well. And we have Han Fei Zi, and all of these zi are fully pronounced zi because that's almost like a title. It's like your honored, distinguished, it's almost like Professor Lao, or almost like, you know, some title added next, at the end, attached to their um, individual name, and then name them as the regarded scholar. And that's Z. Um, but here is a light tone, it's a Z. Long Z. So when you don't have that curve sound, that means it's a generic person. It's not, you don't own names like that. I mean, thousands of years, we only have uh, a few distinguished scholars and their name are forever <laughs> living. So that's a rare case. Most of us ended with this light tone, z, z, long z. So that, that's like generic. We just, there's no special title attached to that. And actually this came from son or children or child. Um, this big head circle, this big head and this torso, kind of baby in a, in a bundle. They don't have their leg functions yet. They're just lying there and have their arms that's movable. And most of the expressions come from the arms, right? That's how baby they are. So probably this more like children, even children have different stages, right? So these are more like infants. They don't have their legs out yet. Uh, so that's hmm, deaf infant. Oh. You can kind of see, right? If we say long, long means deaf. And if we pair it with this light tone generic, the almost dismissive, right? It's, it's kind of child, it's baby, it's infant, it's 
It's somebody who, who cannot take care of themselves, basically. They are dependent. They are like infants. They need to be cared for. Um, I guess in a lot of sense, in some sense, it is true, but they can be self-sustained, grown-up ones. Um, but Chinese, just in the language, um, this light tone was used to kind of um, mark it with a little bit derogative tone there, at least to uh, to call out that this is uh, not a not a dependent person. This is somebody you need to extra care, I guess. Long, okay, came from. Of course, the ear symbol in there. This is the ear, uh, Chinese representation of the ear. So it's something on the side of your head um, with some, you know, signal picking function. So I guess this is the ear uh, structure. And the top of it, gosh, the top of it, the whole thing, super complicated. It's an important concept in Chinese that means dragon. And I have to point out <laughs> that Chinese dragon is water spitting instead of fire spitting in Western culture. So dragon in Chinese, now I've realized now because it was legendary animal, right? Nobody ever see it, but it was in our vocabulary. So who this dragon actually is, um, or maybe it's a collective dragon. It's like a whole class of a dragon mystical figure out there. Later on, I realized, okay, it's actually Chinese personification of weather condition. Because as agrarian society, having the perfect weather for your crops is essential for your survival, right? So this human, how can humans, the farmers, relate to weather condition? How can they negotiate with the weather condition? They have to kind of personify them and they cannot personify it. I mean, well, I guess in, in, in Greek mythology, right? All this lighting bulbs or rain or whatever natural phenomenon can be personified into a god or goddess, right? Somebody in charge of that. We can personify that way. But in Chinese, actually, we personify this in this to, to this mythical figure that are that has horns, has scales, because it's some someone who is in charge of weather conditions. And weather means rainfall. What volume of rainfall, right? And this dragon figure can crawl across the sky, adapt at absolutely this dragon can fly, can air travel with ease, even without wings, right? It's a scaled animal, it's not feathered. It's a scaled, uh, scaling because it's waterproof. It's 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 someone who generate rain. So it, it itself gotta be waterproof and it can be as big or small, as sick or sane, as visible or invisible as, as it wish. So in that alone, kind of describe the infinite changes of weather condition, like how much rain, how much wind or, 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 or weather condition you get, right? Um, contemporarily, we have this weather broadcasting and we have all kinds of metrics to measure the rainfall, the wind, the humidity, all of that. So before any of that quantification or study or charting down, measuring weather condition, this mythical dragon represent all of that. And humans all this time try to negotiate why you think we pray so much, right? We have this divine decoder and that I would imagine that divine decoder's primary job is to negotiate with the dragons, right? Um, but here we pair this mythical, critical, life critical, mythical figure that kind of control the whole year's harvesting, right? The timing, the volume of the rain, all matters. Anything go off, you're screwed for the year, right? So this dragon, so critical to human lives, yet, when it pairs with ear, it's death. 
that says loud <laughs> how powerless farmers feel in front of this mythical weather conditioned God. I mean, I, I'm using Greek mythology, but in Chinese it's dragon. So for this water controller, ultimate water controller in the sky, it's death. It's non-human, so it's not communicatable. It's not talkable. They, it's not dependent on humans' will or negotiation. We can do all the offerings or talking we want. It will turn a deaf ear to us because it's weather. It's beyond the human control. It's unpredictable even. Well, I guess ancient times there is, must be some predictor you know, some somebody who can read the sky better than others, right? Um, but this long, this, this mythical dragon weather condition um, symbol in Chinese culture paired with ear, I think that, that essentially just depict the condition, the, the relationship between humans and weather condition. Okay, and paired with a little bit, you know, helpless infant image uh, together, that means a deaf person. And yeah, but last time we talked about yeah, right? Yeah, it's somebody who's sealed in, this container sealed in without any opening. So it's even if you have a mouth, there's nothing can come out because they are sealed somehow, right? Or sealed, you cannot speak. So that's a mute. And the but I didn't explain fully. Um but is a little bit mystical, kind of like a dragon. Um, it's this big head with a tail, right? So it depicts the image of kind of a crawling thing. It could be a snake. Um, so it's a sort of a thing, it's a living thing, but it's, it's not human. You can see it's not two leg beam, it's one long tail. So it's not a human, but it's a living crawling thing. Um, and we pair this thing with mute. I mean, it's essentially also derogative, right? It's not viewing muted person as a full person. It's pair it with the thing together, this crawling thing as a living being, but it's not human. It's Chinese language capturing of disabled person in different capacities and pair them with either infant or a crawling, living, non-human one leg or it's not a leg or long tail thing. And okay, I have to acknowledge that because before when I used a long zi yaba, I never thought about the language, what's behind the judgment of the language packed into these phrases. I never thought about that until I have to share the lesson and face my language, face my ancestors who created this language to it's totally politically incorrect in 2022 in the English language context, but this language was created thousands of years ago in Chinese context and pair them with derogative meaning, helpless figures or silent cannot, you know, speaking is non-commutable saying figure, maybe not that uh, derogative, but that's how the language came across. Okay, so what deaf and muted disabled person can do, can accomplish? So in 2005, this national TV uh, to celebrate Chinese New Year, it's once a year biggest show of the night, used to be. Now, nowadays, probably less, fewer people care about that. But 2005, it was still hit uh, for, uh, for the national TV on a, you know, imagine 1.3, billion people watched the same thing together, quite a quite an event. So in that year, this was the hit show. Uh, it's called A Thousand Hands. I don't know how to pronounce that. Bodhisattva, Indian word, means a type of Buddha. And this Buddha is the one with compassion. This is the Buddha that people look up to when they are suffering. So this is the Buddha who is in charge of human suffering, at least, you know, listen to them, to their prayer and help them out whenever she or he can. And probably this Buddha is gender fluid too. 
because there are different representations of the Buddha. It could be male or female. You couldn't really tell. And um, this Buddha got thousands of hands here. Simply means the Buddha is busy. It's just, you know, trying to help out whoever the Buddha can and have thousand hands to help you. So instead of like, you know, in Western Christianity, God, everybody pray to God, negotiate with God, try to get something from God, try to get some sort of guarantee or protection or, you know, get something from God. And God is this omnipotent figure that can keep chart of everybody's performance and probably help and provide for everybody. I mean, in, in our mind, we don't exactly know how God, God does that. Computer can multitask, but not really. Simply because the computer fast enough to human speed, it looks like a multitasking, but computer, it can parallel processing. We can set it up that way, but in human scale or capacity, how can we imagine somebody who is so capable to help thousands of millions of people at the same time? This is the answer <laughs> because this Buddha who's, who's in charge of listening or helping out people in suffering have thousand arms. That's how this Buddha multitask. And of course, in this dance, it's, it's represented as a female figure. Um, and the females are probably um, more, <laughs> more on average, a compassionate gender of the many genders we have. <laughs> so um, this show was a hit because all the dancers, 21 of them, they're all at the age 21 and they are all deaf and muted. Imagine how hard for them to coordinate their movement in space and make this perfect rendering of a dance in, in sync without hearing the music. For dancers, getting in sync with music is essential. It's, it's a dance, Dance as an art form travels through time and space, right? You have to map that spatial sense to the timing so things can get coordinated, especially if you dance with multiple people. Here is 21 dancers together have to perform in sync and they all <laughs> deaf and muted. They cannot hear the music. So how do they accomplish that? That itself is a mystery. It's an accomplishment that I can present this show. And I want to, I want to show you this um, hit show in 2005 of this creation of 21 ladies coming together to show the beauty. And they can still present themselves as, as goddess, basically, as Buddha, who are compassionate and to, you know, Put, put out this artwork uh, to share in spite of their um, conditions. Okay, so that's the Longzi and the Ya. But catching to the currency of thinking by one word a day with Sophie. See you another day.